that. I've spent a number of years um, studying neuroscience, reading papers, and first the essential aspect of this for me was learning the vocabulary, um, learning parts of the brain, and trying to put it into a larger context uh, in relation to my studies in philosophy, linguistics, um, and uh, various other subjects, which I think has been extremely helpful. And uh, we might begin by thinking about the 19th century roots um, of neuroscience. And I know that in your work you have mentioned both philosophical and um, scientific origins of certain ideas, for example, homeostasis. Yeah, it's a very, very important, very central uh, idea. Homeostasis is a sort of long word, not terribly beautiful, um, but it refers, and one good way of giving a synonym uh, of homeostasis is life regulation. Yes. Uh, and it is something that has been extremely important in the history of neuroscience, uh, and I think it's going to become even more important as we go forward. Uh, in the 19th century, uh, a number of uh, major physiologists, uh, physiologists um, perhaps most importantly Claude Bernard, yes. uh, a, a French um, biologist and physiologist, um, talked about uh, life regulation and talked about the fact that we have inside ourselves uh, an internal milieu, yes. uh, something which is entirely inside the, the membrane, the, the covering of our organism, uh, and that of course contains all the roving chemistries uh, of, of that, that allow life to be inside the boundary of one's body. Um, and he, he talked about the fact that there were very specific forces and very specific processes that regulated this incredible process and made it compatible with life. Uh, and actually the word homeostasis only came to be it's coined. It's canon. It's canon. Yes, it's it, quite late. Quite late. It's in yes. the 20th century. It's much, much later. Yes, but um, in 1915, Freud talks about something very similar in yeah. instincts and their vicissitudes, an yes. essay that's not a late essay of Freud's, really. Yeah. And uh, he's already talking about something that is very much, I think, compatible with the idea of home homeostasis. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and the, it was something that, you know, as very often happens in, in these, uh, with these ideas and with some of these facts, they're in the air. Yes. And, uh, and different uh, investigators, writers, thinkers take them uh, and use them in their work and absolutely. sometimes with different names, um, but they're there. They're, 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 they're part of the uh, of, of, of the thinking style and of the thinking apparatus Absolutely. and of the vocabulary it's, it's, of the It's time. almost like an atmospheric yeah. uh, uh, a condition yeah. so that these ideas, um, and we can get to this later, but I'm very interested in how the sometimes ideas seem to be absorbed almost by osmosis, so to speak, yeah. as, you know, unconsciously, not necessarily consciously. Right. But Helmholtz, for example, also Freud, was highly indebted to biophysics and to people who came before him. So it's not as if he invented this idea. No, and, and, uh, and of course one always has to think also that people very often change their careers as they go along, and Freud yes. is a very good case in point. Freud really begins as a neurologist. Absolutely. Uh, very much with the same kind of training that uh, I had, yep. uh, except uh, one century before. Uh, and it is very interesting that a lot of the uh, formative ideas of neurological training yes. for Freud appear expressed in things that have apparently nothing to do with neurology as such. Uh, for example, the, the, yeah. the sort of tripartite division uh, of of one's mind. Yes. With uh, the different, ego the e and, 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 and uberich or e superego. Exactly. Uh, all, all of that matches very well uh, and, and was probably very much inspired by what Freud knew uh, of neuroanatomy. 
Uh, and if he had not known neuroanatomy, if he had not had yes. to train with the neurology of the time, that might not have come the way it did, uh, it did to, to him. Absolutely. And the fact that somewhat later Freud includes um, unconsciousness in his idea of the ego, I find very interesting and very compatible with your ideas and other ideas that are abroad in neuroscience now that um, what we think of as the self or our subjectivity is highly influenced by these unconscious forces, an unconscious yep. part of the self yep. that is not reflective. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that we are, we are in fact this uh, hodgepodge of non-conscious and conscious processes with some part of our uh, consciousness trying to ride herd over this yes. mess of, uh, of <laughs> yes. non-conscious processes and uh, w which of course needs to be very uh, clearly spelled out because you, 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 you have of course the, the, the people that listen to something like what we're saying and you say oh my god they're saying that you have no control over oh, right. oneself and over one's behavior and no willpower of any kind and of course that's false because we do have a measure of control but it is not true that we have full control no and it is not true that when uh, we are executing an action we are necessarily controlling it at that moment, at that consciously. Moment. Yes, I think this might be an opportunity to talk about a very famous um, uh, uh, finding that created tremendous uproar among philosophers and neuroscientists, which is Benjamin Libet's right. finding, which is very simple for people who don't know about this, is that subjects were asked to move a finger, mm -hmm. for example, this finger. And Libet discovered that something called a readiness potential in the brain that could be measured um, was going off about a third to a half of a second, if yeah, I re remember yeah, correctly, yeah. before the subject had any conscious awareness of wanting, wanting to, to move, move the <laughs> finger. Now, this, of course, became a free will debate. Right. And when I read these findings and read other people talking about them, I remember saying to myself, does free will necessarily have to be, first of all, a fully conscious mm -hmm. action? I mean, if you're thirsty and you get a glass of water, you don't necessarily have full subjective linguistic consciousness of getting a glass of water, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, but also, I think you might want to refine this notion of the degree to which a finding like that does not tell us that we have no free will. Well, it, it, it doesn't because in fact most of, the th most of the notions that we associate with deliberation and decisions that are important for one's life are not taken the same way that we move this finger or that we pick up That's the glass. Right. Uh, when, we, uh, and, and, and w when we think about uh, important decisions in one's life when we think about for example what we're going to do uh, with ourselves in terms of one's career or what we're going to you know uh, how are our relationships going to be whom we're going to get married to or live with uh, those decisions are not taken on the on the fly those decisions are in fact deliberated and I, I love the word deliberate yes. and it's a word that has sort of disappeared from the vocabulary of decision-making studies but that's exactly what you do and sometimes you deliberate uh, for over minutes or hours yes. or weeks or months yes. and and you do it not in the moment of execution of the action you do it offline you yes. do you take yourself away from the moment and you put yourself in a space that in fact competes with what you're doing in the moment. One, yes. one thing that I like yes. to point out is that if you are deliberating even about something as simple as what you're going to do this afternoon for a moment you say how am I going to plan this I need to talk to three different people and I have only a certain number of hours right. how am I going to organize this. You don't do that this, at the same time that you drive and drink glasses of water and other such. You take yourself away from the perceptual moment. Yes. And in fact, you do that in such a way that others looking at you 
uh, will get the impression that you are distracted. Yes. And when somebody says that you are distracted, you're not paying attention. It means you're not paying attention to, to me. me. Yes. Uh, you, what you're paying attention <laughs> is what, to what you're going to do. Yes. Now, and that, and, and it's very interesting, Siri, because what that does is also give you an incredible inkling as to how and where these processes are going on in the brain, because it immediately serves notice that there's a competition going on between what is in the perceptual yes. brain. Phenomenal and, reality. Exactly. And what is in your mind's eye and ear as you plan stuff. Exactly. And because, in fact, those two spaces are one and the same. Yes. Then there is a competition and most brains. Spatially, uh, as if we want to use that metaphor, in it, the brain, yeah. they are necessarily in competition. They are necessarily in competition. So, in, and that's why, for example, there are all these things that are very well known that people sort of turn their eyes up and sort of look at the ceiling as they're thinking. Yes. Or they close their eyes. They right. close their eyes as they deliberate. Right. Because if they don't close their eyes, they're going to to have the images of the perceptual right, moment exactly. competing with the images that they're forming. Absolutely, the and attention is a fairly limited quantity in the human mind. Exactly. In other words, you can pay attention to something out there, or you can pay attention to what I call the internal narrator, yeah. but paying attention to both does not work. Right. I mean, the interesting experience of, for example, reading, that we both do a great deal of, yeah. And suddenly I realize that I am reading the page, I am taking in the words, but my mind has traveled. This right. is a familiar experience. Yeah. My mind has traveled onto some other subject so that I have some cognitive relation to the page, but it's not one of semantics and understanding. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And, and, and there is, but, but what, what is so... Uh, what, what is so fascinating is the limitation of this space, is, is the fact that we don't have, e in other words, yes. our, our, our screens. And, um, you know, the, the, I've been through uh, hating uh, metaphors that have to do with right. theaters.